land of extremes. Wealth and poverty walk side by side. There are amazing cities of light, full of multi-ethnic individuals, all chasing the dream. Wild frontiers of natural beauty and danger. Vast tracts of farmland and dense dark woods. The world's biggest, smallest, loudest and fastest of everything. Incredible landscapes, incredible people, incredible history. America is the home of the brave and free, a place where freedom of speech, thought, religion and politics are espoused and held dear. Or is it? John F. Kennedy once said, The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society, and we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths and to secret proceedings. But is this really the truth? Is America the nation the result of just a series of events? Or is it part of some grand design from some even grander architect? Is the history of the modern United States of America exactly as taught in schools? Or is there a secret? Is there some kind of mystical background at the heart of what America has become? From books to movies, there has been much speculation that the founding of the good old US of A was really the result of a secretive group known as the Freemasons. If it is true that the United States of America was formed with and by a backbone of Lodge members, then it is also true that the entire world is influenced by them. But where did this all begin? The oldest known and verified Masonic work is the Halliwell Manuscript, which dates from around 1390. In this work, it is stated that the craft of masonry began with Euclid in Egypt and eventually arrived in England during the reign of King Athelstan. The Cook Manuscript from a similar period links masonry to the children of Israel while still in Egypt. This is a myth concocted to link Freemasonry to the children of God. In truth, all we can say for certain is that masonry, as we would recognise it today, erupted in the 18th century, the very time of the forming of the United the States Declaration of, of Independence nurtured a new breed of community in a world of confusion, repudiating precedent and usage, dominating old world states, which had evolved slowly, painfully, and planlessly from preceding things. These Americans, for history's first time, planned and made. Many have speculated that the knowledge and wisdom of the Lodge was brought to Europe via the Crusaders, such as the Knights Templar. It is speculated that they discovered some form of secret or wisdom beneath the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem, that they kept this hidden from the Catholic authorities. Some have said this knowledge was of the child of Jesus, 
and that his bloodline was special, giving rise to the royalty of Europe. Much of this myth has come from the infamous books The Holy Blood and the Holy Grail and Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code, which in turn took their information from a very real organisation, the Order of the Fleur de Lis, whose list of past masters mirrors that of the secretive and highly fictional Priory of Sion. Members of the Order of the Fleur de Lis spent time hunting out the burial site of Mary Magdalene in southern France, and many were, and are, Freemasons. Others claim it was a form of Gnostic wisdom, with instructions on the proper method of building for sacred purposes. The latter, of course, playing straight into the idea of the Masons, Whatever the truth, the sacred geometry used for hundreds of years in buildings across Europe can indeed be traced back to civilizations such as those of Egypt. They are the same because sacred geometry is something discovered in nature, not created by man. And it is the law of nature that is of paramount importance to the secrets within the Freemasons, as we shall see. Cloaked within these Catholic orders, the wisdom of Egypt was supposedly passed on from generation to generation, slowly forming into a structure that was finally written down in the 18th century. Grand designs in the United States, such as the Washington Memorial, and indeed the whole of the Washington ground plan, can be shown to have the influence of Masonic sacred geometry. But does this mean the Knights Templar really discovered this wisdom, and that eventually gave rise to the secretive institution called the Freemasons? What we do know is this, it was not and never has been an institution for the ordinary man. Regardless of what modern Freemasons believe, the leaders from the very beginning were royalty, knights, heads of religion, leaders of industry, officers in the military, government ministers or civil servants. In short, they were always and still are highly influential people. And it is these people who ruled the various factions on both sides in the early formations of the USA. I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. British and American officers on opposing sides of the War of Independence were more often than not brothers in the same Freemasonic Lodge. Emerging as a great meeting point for all factions and emerging from the Reformation, Freemasonry became a widespread and secretive collective with religious toleration and liberty at its core. These would become the key words to the forming American nation. The measure of any action is the sentiment from which it springs. The quality of means determines the ethics of ends. Honesty will justify our means. And history will, I trust, applaud our ends. It is easy to see where these fine principles emerged. In the 17th century, Europe was a hotbed of religious intolerance, 
walls spread across the continent using religion as an excuse to grab land and power. Thousands of individuals would suffer torture and death at the hands of the hatred fostered by religious leaders. It is therefore perfectly understandable that people of influence would hide their beliefs of a better way behind the door of the lodge and plot a new way forward in a new land. A new order in a new world. Believing in truth as truth, they ruled out no religious text, for all, they said, contained wisdom. The cornerstone of the Freemason is in fact the search for true wisdom. As their knowledge of the world of other religions grew, so the symbolism of the Lodge became more and more occult, obscure to those who did not understand and hence it appeared to be secretive. All-seeing eyes, pentagrams, pyramids, pillars, orbs and more all became recognisable as Freemasonic images the world over. In a land far away from war-torn and intolerant Europe, the Freemasons were free to spread their ideas and it quickly grew in strength and stature. The core beliefs of tolerance swiftly found its way into the politics of the land. George Washington, first in war, first in peace. His grateful countrymen called him to be their first president. A very famous Freemason, George Washington, said, For happily, the government of the United States, which gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance, requires only that they live under its protection, should demean themselves as good citizens. What Washington was saying here is a Freemasonic principle, that this brand new nation did not just recognize and understand minority religions, but accepted its people as equals. Liberty, fraternity, equality the very words that Freemasons of Europe would raise up in the newly freed France. Freemasonic American politics totally rejected the old ways of domineering religions and royalty. Their way, they claimed, was a free republic of equal citizens, whilst all the time maintaining their positions in high places. On the 4th of July, 1776, the Continental Congress, under direction of Freemasons, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and John Adams, ordered a great seal to be struck, and which now appears on the back of the infamous dollar bill. The all-seeing eye and the great pyramid, two symbols full of meaning and symbolism for the Freemason. Beneath the pyramid were placed the Latin words that translate roughly as God smiles on our new order of the ages. It was the final statement that the Freemasons had succeeded in freeing themselves of the past hatred and intolerance of continental Europe and were to make their new Jerusalem on these new shores. The years following the Declaration of Independence nurtured a new breed of community in a world of confusion. Repudiating precedent and usage dominating old world states which had evolved slowly, painfully, and planlessly from preceding things, these Americans, for history's first time, planned and made a nation. And then in the York... The old world was left behind and a new world order was to emerge and influence every continent on the globe. The question is, did the founding Freemasonic Fathers realise what they were creating? Did they know the United States of America 
would emerge as a dominating world power. A country of millions with wealth beyond the imagination of many in the world. The answer is, yes they did. They were creating a utopian Jerusalem, a heaven on earth, and the foundations had to be firm. To their very core they realised this, and that is why such amazing efforts were taken to empower the people with a certain amount of freedom and democracy. It truly was a chance to have another go at nation building, free of the choking restrictions of royalty and religion. And yet, as with all religions and politics created by man, there are those who wish to maintain or grow their own power base. Just like religion, the ideals were great and good, but many of those behind them were not so great and good. Across the world, Freemasons were already dividing into factions and the same is true of those in America. In 1733, the provincial Grand Master of all North America, Henry Price, granted a charter to a group of Freemasons in Boston. A most auspicious day for the Freemasons, as it was for the Knights Templar and the Knights of Malta. The 24th of June, St John's Day, and this new lodge was to be known as St John's Lodge. St John was seen as equal importance by many to Jesus. He was the man who would have baptised Christ and came before him proclaiming the new way, just as Freemasons would usher in a new world. Lodges were created from 1715 onwards across the states with infamous names such as Benjamin Franklin helping to steer the course. George Washington was initiated into the lodge at Fredericksburg in 1752. In Boston, illustrious names such as Paul Revere and Joseph Warren would be the Freemasons who started a famous revolutionary tea party. And yet, many lodges were attached to British Army regiments. Many believe that an entire nation arose to fight off the tyranny of the British, but this is not the entire truth. 38% of colonists were either neutral or supported the Crown of Great Britain. This left 62% in favour of independence, and even less that wanted actual war. When war did come, there was no decisive battle. At the end of the war, most British regiments were in fact fully intact, and were well placed to continue to rage war. Instead, the history simply shows an end, as if everybody had become weary. What possible reason could there truly have been for the British to just decide to stop fighting when the truth was that nothing had occurred to prove they had lost? The truth is something that is seldom taught in schools. The truth is that the Freemasons on both sides decided the time was right. It is historical fact that commanders on both sides of the war were Freemasons. In addition to this, there were also many British nobles and businessmen. Freemasons are under oath to each other. They swear to protect each other 
regardless of what is happening around them. Penalties for not doing so were severe. It was a matter of honour among brothers that they should not fight. A moral dilemma was very apparent on both sides. If we ignore the battles between the common soldiers, we discover many nobles and men of high rank not engaging in extremes and even coming to the aid of brothers on opposing forces. This kind of dilemma would and did create a stalemate. Exactly the same as witnessed at the end of the conflict. In the mother country, the ordinary British people had no interest in a continuing fight, and this played directly into the hands of the Freemasons, who knew precisely what the colonists were trying to do in creating a new Jerusalem. This new world began in 1776 with the Republic and power assigned to the people. With orderly efficiency, the first government was formed. John Jay became the first Chief Justice. And by general accord, Madison became leader of the House. Then a cabinet of secretaries rather than ministers was appointed. Hamilton Treasury, Knox War, Randolph Attorney General, Jefferson Foreign Affairs. Equality was of prime importance, and no man or woman was to be greater than another. The government of the USA was a mirror of the Lodge. Officers are elected. They serve a term of office and can be impeached if they are proved to be unworthy. The federal government itself was a direct copy of the federalism of the Grand Lodge. In the mother country, the mad George III may not himself be known as a Freemason, but six of his seven sons would be. The dice cast by the secret brothers changed the face of the world. Great Britain had an empire the like of which the world had not seen before, and the influence of Freemasonry was now to spread far and wide. Later, so-called revolutions, such as the one we call the First World War, would see the collapse of monarchs across Europe and the rise of Freemasonic power. In addition to this, a Freemason by the name of Adam Weishaupt created a new Masonic order in Bavaria called the Illuminati, which was to catch the eye of many and still does. There is no real hard evidence that the Illuminati still exist, but their influence on the world stage was vast. Jefferson spoke highly of Weissapp, and Washington wrote in a letter about the Illuminati. It was not my intention to doubt that the doctrines of the Illuminati had not spread to the United States. On the contrary, no one is more truly satisfied of this fact than I am. This is clear evidence that this highly secret group had in fact spread into the USA. And for what purpose? We only have to look at the words of Weishaupt himself when he said, the Illuminati will, by degrees, and in silence, possess themselves of the government of the states, and make use of those means. And what use? The stated purpose of this secret society within a secret society was to bring down all forms of government and religion in order to make everyone equal. Were they successful? A few years later, the 
Prime Minister of Great Britain, Benjamin Disraeli, would say, the world is governed by people far different from those imagined by the public. A famous statement by the Illuminati reveals why history can often be confusing, why sometimes it appears there are two sides when in truth there is only one end result already planned. The statement goes thus, it doesn't matter who the people voted for, they always vote for us. An interesting statement from a Jesuit created Freemasonic group. In 1782, a great gathering of Freemasons and related secret societies was convened at a Rothschild estate in Wilhelmsbad. Here, the Illuminati merged formally with the Freemasons and went on to establish lodges in the USA. From these lodges came a great many future American leaders. For the Freemasons, by the early 1800s, a certain amount of dissent had set in. In 1826, a William Morgan disappeared from New York following a threat to expose the secrets of Freemasonry. Many claimed he had been murdered. His kidnappers were caught and yet received light punishments. Protests erupted across the United States and many left the craft. In 1827, the Grand Lodge of New York had controlled 227 lodges, and yet by 1835, this had reduced to only 41. It was now a widespread belief that the Freemasons were running the country, and the political battles ensued. Anti-Freemason Thurlow Weed initiated a political movement that actually balloted for the presidency in 1828. John Quincy Adams wrote his damning book, Letters on the Masonic Institution. And yet, there was more afoot than the public would realise. The actual presidential candidate put forward by the movement, one William Wirt, was in fact a Freemason. He even gave a speech at an anti-Masonic convention defending the institution. Within three years, the party disbanded. The public had lost interest and slavery was the new battleground. 19th century political spin doctors had done their job well. Behind the scenes and out of public gates, the same old Freemasonic guard carried on running the nation. As the 32nd President and Freemason, Franklin D. Roosevelt would later say, in politics, nothing happens by accident. If it happens, you can bet it was planned that way. Patience is a virtue, and by 1850, Freemasonry was on the increase again. It grew from 66,000 members to over 200,000, with 5,000 lodges nationwide. By the time of the American Civil War, it was so widespread that both sides in the conflict were often seen to join in lodges together. Soldiers and sailors were reported across the country to be actually saving enemy combatants purely because they had identified themselves as Freemasons.
special treatment was meted out to Masonic prisoners of war, and even special burials during battles for brothers regardless on whose side they had fought. There is no speculation in these stated facts. It is historical. It is true. It is also not restricted to the USA. Across the world, exactly the same things were occurring. Conflicts created for whatever purpose were throwing brothers against brothers, and yet they were meeting and greeting at lodges in the moments of respite. Some schisms occurred, such as the split between the French lodges and others, but these did not stop mutual respect and associations outside of technicalities. Most of the divisions were in fact caused by one of the very things that Freemasonry had originally attempted to escape, religious intolerance. It is to religion that we now turn. Most people would believe that America was founded by good, honest Christians, a Christian nation under one God. The following statement is from a book entitled A History of the York and Scottish Rites of Freemasonry by Henry R. Evans. Into Freemasonry have been poured the irradations of the mystical schools of antiquity. Particularly is this so in the high degrees of the order, such as the Scottish Rite, where undeniable traces of Kabbalism, Neoplatonism, Rosicrucianism, and other mystical cults are plainly discernible. I do not personally contend that Freemasonry is the direct descendant of the mysteries, but that our ritual makers of the higher degrees have copied the ancient ceremonies of initiation so far as the knowledge of those ceremonies exists. Christianity was held within the Freemasonries, as were other concepts. All were accepted. A kind of hybrid state occurred where the mystery religions merged with Christianity. In truth, they all come from the same sources, and that is where Freemasonry is correct and born-again believers are wrong. Jesus didn't just arrive with a brand new way. The words attributed to this man were from far earlier sources such as Jewish Gnosticism and Egypt. The knowledge built up over time by the Freemasons has in fact brought them into conflict with modern-day born-again Christians who see them as the devil's own. At the end of the day, all one must believe in to be a Freemason is a supreme being, regardless of what title man places upon him. The very men who helped to forge the nation that would become the United States of America were Freemasons who understood this principle. They fought on both sides of political and physical battles whilst maintaining allegiance to the Brotherhood. Benjamin Franklin, John Claypool, Ethan Allen, John Hancock, Thomas Jefferson, John Paul Jones, Paul Revere, Thomas Paine, and George Washington were but a few linked with the Lodge. Two of these men were the primary authors of that great American document, the Declaration of Independence, Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson. And what of the Constitution? 28 of the 40 who signed the document were known or possible Freemasons. I have watched 
watch that constitution growing like a tree from first the sprout planted by Samuel Adams and his correspondence committees and then the united action of the association of 1774 in the history of this nation there is deserved an honorable page for that association that was the trunk and those articles were the trunk's first branches and then the branches lifted up and spread into a sturdy tree of liberty with shade enough for all the french liaison officer for the colonies lafayette was a freemason most of the commanders in the continental army were lodge members most of Washington's generals were Masons. Indeed, the Boston Tea Party was organized by Freemasons in a tavern called the Green Dragon. It was also known as the Freemasons Arms. When George Washington was sworn in as the very first president of the USA, it was by a man called Robert Livingston, the Grand Master of the New York Masonic Lodge. His hand rested on a Bible taken from the lodge itself. He was surrounded by lodge members. There was no secrecy. In a symbolic, physical statement, the very cornerstone of the Capitol building was laid by the Grand Lodge of Maryland. As we can see, the forging of America was by the Freemasons. Some stand out more than others. It's time to take a look at them in more detail in order to unlock further secrets. One of the most influential men in the American Revolution was Benjamin Franklin, a writer, scientist, philosopher, and of course, Freemason. Dr. Benjamin Franklin. Mr. President. As a journalist, Franklin would write many pro-Masonic articles, published in the Pennsylvania Gazette. In 1749, he was elected Grand Master of the province. In the 1770s, he was a diplomat working in France, where he was made Grand Master of the Nine Sisters Lodge in Paris. At the very same lodge were Danton, the later French revolutionary, and Lafayette, oh, and Paul Jones, both heroes of the American War of Independence. It was here that Franklin raised funds amongst his brothers to fight the war against the British royal tyrants. In addition to this, Franklin was also a Rosicrucian Grandmaster, a secret society of the mystery cults. There is also evidence to show that Benjamin Franklin was in fact a secret agent of the British Intelligence Agency, itself a creation of an earlier secret society based upon the mystery traditions. In London, he worked with Sir Francis Dashwood, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who founded a secret order known as the Hellfire. These links across a secretive world allowed Franklin to manipulate the powers, to spread word widely and secretly, to enact plans created in private between some of the most powerful men in the world. Revolution does not just happen, it is in fact planned, and masses cajoled into behaving as desired. 
Thomas Jefferson, a Freemason, actually explained in his preface to the Declaration of Independence what Franklin's and the Freemasons were actually doing. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitles them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. This declaration was natural law, not that of a Christian God. It was necessary to dissolve the political links in order to see these laws of nature. The old world was so corrupt with its royalty and man-made religious rules that it was time to create a new world. The capital, Washington, was laid out according to Masonic principles and sacred geometry. Adjusted by George Washington and Jefferson to ensure that it was correct in every element. The great seal of the United States, as seen on the dollar bill itself, is a Freemasonic symbol that openly states their purpose. The unfinished pyramid is the Masonic trestle board explaining the task ahead of completion is a Freemasonic role. The 13 steps to the pyramid are of mystical importance. There are 13 stars and the Latin phrase has 13 letters. The eagle clutches 13 olive leaves and berries and 13 arrows. What is the significance? It derives from Genesis and is a nod to the 13th tribe of Israel, that of Manasseh whose symbols were an olive branch and a bundle of arrows, peace and war in balance. The founding Freemasons were stating that the USA was symbolically the 13 tribes, the fulfilment of a time when all will be well. when all nations will come together in one land. Hard-fought freedom for all, equality, fraternity, liberty. They point to the biblical book Ezekiel as evidence. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword, and is gathered out of many people, against the mountains of Israel, which have been always waste, but it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. They shall dwell safely there in the land of the free. The eagle itself is evidence for this for it is biblically the destroyer of serpents. The all-seeing eye is that of the Freemasons and their grand architect, all-seeing all over the world. The seal of the United States is boldly full of Freemasonic symbolism, stating the New World Order in Latin for all to see. They make no apology for it, and why should they? As in the later Spanish Revolt, itself blatantly orchestrated by Freemasons and aided by American money, they were proud to have bought the land back from the sword, so they shall dwell safely once more. The Spanish flag itself would also become a Freemasonic symbol. The 
33rd Vice President of America, Henry Wallace, was a Freemason who openly explained what the symbolism was really about. It was the role of the USA to become the leader of nations. He wrote, It will take a more definite recognition of the grand architect of the universe before the apex stone is finally fitted into place. And this nation, in the full strength of its power, is in a position to assume leadership amongst the nations in inaugurating the new order of the ages. The question is this, if these leaders of men are so sure that the USA is the new Jerusalem, here to bring in a new age and lead the world, then what are they doing to ensure this actually happens? Religion is a powerful thing. People will go to their deaths for it. Politics, not quite so powerful. Bringing such religious power into politics is no different to the bishops of Europe wielding their power over the people. Surely, religion, whether Christianity, or belief in a supreme being or grand architect, should be kept out of politics altogether. And so, free brother of America, what if you wished to join this fraternal organisation? How would you begin it? And does this give us any insight? Given that the Freemasons are a very secretive group, hiding their rituals behind closed doors, there is little surprise to discover that membership has certain obstacles. Firstly, in order to be considered, a petition must be raised by two lodge members. Next, there is a secret ballot, followed by a question that must be answered. Does the candidate believe in God? If the answer is no, then they are refused. So we have an undemocratic secret ballot followed by an enforced belief system. But what about wealth? Any candidate is expected to pay membership fees contribute to the regular events and of course make donations to the various charities that keep them squeaky clean in the public eye. Once you have managed to get through a secret ballot and lied about believing in God, raised enough money and shaken enough hands, you become an entered apprentice. You go through a ritual of initiation that deals with the killing of Hiram Abif. Blindfolded, the initiate is ordered by three men to reveal the Mason's secrets. Of course, he must not tell. He then mocks death and resurrection. The old man, like the old world, is dead and the new man arises. cycles of nature at the root of the secrets. The first degree is complete, but to fully become a Freemason he must go through two more degrees. These are known as Free Craft Mason and Master Mason. As he rises through the degrees, the secrets of the symbols and stories are slowly revealed. He is gradually proving his ability to obey and keep a secret. The next step is to aspire to the supreme order of the Holy Royal Arch. It is at this point that the real name of the Grand Architect of the Universe is revealed. Just in case you wanted to know, the name is Yabul, Yah for the Hebrew Yahweh, Bol for the Canaanite Baal, and On for the Egyptian Osiris. 
all basically the same deity under different names. So what becomes of you should you reveal the secrets? It all depends upon the level you have attained. An apprentice would have his tongue torn out, a free craft would lose his heart, and a master his bowels removed. If you are of the Royal Arch degree, then you have the top of your head sliced off. Although different factions of Freemasons do things in slightly different ways, there are in general 33 degrees in total, with only the absolutely most committed and secretive attaining the 33rd degree. So what does all of this mean to the secret world of America? As it stands today, there are over 15,000 lodges in the USA. That's almost half the total lodges in the entire world. There are 3 million members. That's more than half the total of those in the world. The majority of those members are active community leaders, whether business, banking, law, religion, media or politics. They are still there at the heart of Washington. They still sit on the boards of big corporations. still control the finances. This land that steers the hearts and minds of billions through movies, media, politics and money was influenced from the very beginning by a sincere group of men fleeing tyranny and hoping for a new world. Over time they succeeded creating a truly unique land of opportunity and relative equality. Over time, they have influenced the world and played many games of revolution to assist brothers in far-off lands achieve the same. still in doubt about the influence the Freemasons and the inner sanctum of the Illuminati play, then let us remember the words of one 18th century Freemason who was so shocked by the global conspiracy that he put it down in black and white. John Robinson, a professor of philosophy at Edinburgh University, so disliked the purposes of the Illuminati that he said an association has been formed for the express purpose of rooting out all the religious establishments and overturning all the existing governments the leaders would rule the world with uncontrollable power while all the rest would be employed as tools of the ambition of their unknown superiors General Knox, I've seen the day when your pup and blue was blood blotched. That John Adams might become the first vice president of these United States. And you, James Madison. Our children's children will remember you. 
And you, Alex Hamilton. And you, John Jay. And you, Mr. Randolph. Depending on your point of view, it is either a good thing or a bad thing that they are and still do act in such a way. But I would say that ultimately it is not democracy to have a secret organisation at the heart of government, religion and a powerful business world. A secret organisation that trains the minds of its initiates and accepts nothing less than absolute secrecy and obedience. An organisation that can be proven to have fostered violent revolution across the globe. Should be open and transparent shouldn't it? The Americans declare that all men are created equal, with unalienable rights to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. It is evident that these are very questionable statements. Men are not born equal. Men are not born free. These statements are so manifestly false that it is impossible to believe that the men who made them believed in them. <laughs> Such truths are beyond the understanding of minds lacking imagination and must, perforce, be denied by design and dictation. We declare that unhampered intellect is the natural state decreed by man's creator. They oppose a most unnatural state, a hampering social net decreed by man's stupidity. A net which may enmesh but cannot stifle fundamental truths which confound archaic systems that degrade the individual in exaltation of the state. From those truths springs the American concept of liberty. This is the heritage which is America. A heritage drawn from many people, all of whom had one purpose, to build for themselves and their children a land of freedom from oppression and prejudice. And let us remember this. In their search for those fine principles of liberty, equality and fraternity, they forgot someone. Indian nations upon whom they inflicted mass genocide. But again and again, the pioneers had to be on a sharp lookout for attack. And news that the Indians were on the warpath electrified them into activity. Their struggle for survival against the Indians was never ending. They were a relentless enemy who resented the coming of the white settlers. They fought tooth and nail for every foot of ground and gave way slowly, exacting a terrible toll. Just as hard as the Indians fought, so did the pioneers who needed the land for their families and for freedom.